It's a real treat uh, to be speaking not only with you, but for uh, with all of you who are tuning in. And uh, uh, I'm very excited to talk a little bit about congenital heart disease and adult congenital heart disease, which is uh, truly one of the growth areas in, uh, in heart disease uh, and in heart surgery. Uh, just to put it into perspective a bit, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the slide, I mean, there's really been a lot of progress in the management of patients with congenital heart disease. If you were born in the decade that I was born, uh, if, if you were born with, uh, with complex congenital heart disease, there was really less than a 15% chance that you would survive to adulthood. Uh, we don't. We don't even have the decade that you were born in here, Joe, because it's sort of <laughs> we we can't really find a Rosetta Stone uh, to talk about the hieroglyphics. But uh, but there really has been. Uh, and uh, hats off to our colleagues in uh, in neonatal and pediatric heart surgery and cardiology, who have really made tremendous advances in the diagnosis and treatment of infants and children with congenital heart disease such that now, if you were born with complex congenital heart disease within the last 20 years, there's a 90% chance that you'll survive to adulthood. And, and what that has done is it has created uh, an enormous number of patients that are walking around with all kinds of corrected, repaired, and palliated heart disease that may show up on our doorstep with either uh, problems associated with their uh, operations that they've had before, with new discoveries of their of congenital heart disease, uh, or with acquired heart disease on, on top of that. And just a, a little bit of a, just a, a background, if you, if, you, if you think about what we do in congenital heart disease, Certainly early on, most of our attention was based towards trying to palliate mm -hmm. uh, heart disease, meaning we manipulated the physiology of babies and children with heart disease, meaning that if you had a shunt and you had too much pulmonary blood flow, uh, regardless of what the underlying lesion was, if you had too much pulmonary blood flow, we would put a pulmonary artery band on to decrease the amount of pulmonary blood flow. It didn't matter whether you had a VSD or an AV canal or, or some other kind of complex heterotaxy. If you had too little pulmonary blood flow, if you were cyanotic, if the baby was cyanotic, we'd create any number of shunts. A blalock tausig shunt, which is a shunt from the subclavian artery to the pulmonary artery, be a central shunt, a waterson Cooley shunt from the ascending aorta to the main pulmonary artery, and that would increase the amount of pulmonary blood flow. Those are less commonly done now, or done as part of a plan for a more, uh, uh, for, of a bigger operation. So we don't really see uh, adults walking around with those shunts or bands like we used to. The, the other goal of surgery is reparative surgery, which is you you have an anatomic reconstruction, but you, you leave behind residual lesions. For instance, uh, you might have, uh, if, you, if you, had, you didn't have a right ventricular outflow tract and you had a ventricular septal defect, you could close a ventricular septal defect and sew a conduit on to mm -hmm. the right ventricle mm -hmm. to the pulmonary artery. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you fix the anatomy but you leave behind something that's gonna cause problems. Uh, uh, that conduit may stenose. You may end up with calcification. You may outgrow that conduit. Uh, so even though it's an anatomic correction, you know that there are strings attached and there's gonna be potential problems. Can, can I ask, and I don't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, but sure. Can I ask, should, uh, is that something we could potentially see with a patient who, uh, had that, that, that shunt put in, 
and they come in for revascularization or mm -hmm. for an isolated valve replacement, and then what would happen with that? Well, that, therein lies the problem, Joe, because in addition to reparative, there's also what we re refer to corrective surgery, where we think we actually fix the problem and don't leave anything behind. I mean, the, the classic example for that would be closing an atrial septal defect mm -hmm. or a ventricular septal defect. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. thought kids that had arterial switch operations, that that was corrective. Well, as it turns out, um, we don't correct things as, as much as we think we did. And, and the next slide kind of shows that. Um, this shows you this wave of adults with congenital heart disease. If you study this graph, what's been pretty constant over the last 20 years or so is the number of children with congenital heart disease. That's the steady yellow bar mm -hmm. down below. And then the orange, uh, I don't know what's that, a trapezoid? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the point is, is that the number is increasing. And those are, those are adults with congenital heart disease that are continuing to grow. And then even the older patients uh, over 60 continues to grow. And so many of these patients were told at the time of their operation that they were cured, they were fixed. So they're walking around thinking that they're cured or fixed. They're not being followed by cardiologists uh, or uh, you know congenital cardiologists, cardiac surgeons. So to directly answer your question, yes, they could show up to anybody's doorstep because uh, to the best of their knowledge, their problem has been fixed. Mm -hmm. But I guess the best we can say is that they were fixed for a time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, so, you know, just to, to put it in to a little organized way, so the way that we, we run across adults with congenital heart disease is, is we still do find, particularly patients who uh, have immigrated to the country uh, people who show up with a new uh, uh, or unknown lesion that went undiagnosed uh, or the natural history of a lesion that was repaired or corrected uh, as well as natural history of palliated lesions that we mm -hmm. that we talked about and then you know all of these uh, now adults well they're they're not they're not protected from developing coronary artery disease or degenerative valve disease or heart failure, uh, that, um, that they would show up for us to help take care of. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, so uh, you know, just as an example of a couple of, uh, probably the most, you know, common, uh, uh, one of the most common things we see now uh, in adults are patients who are treated with tetralogy of fellow. A uh, tetralogy of Fallot is uh, that and transposition of the great arteries uh, are the two most common cyanotic heart lesions uh, in infancy. And tetralogy of Fallot uh, is uh, uh, four uh, lesions that uh, show up together. Uh, you, you, you have a malalignment of the components of the uh, ventricular septum, the conal septum, is anteriorly malpositioned. And that moves the aorta uh, over towards the right. Mm -hmm. That malposition, uh, so that's one of the four. The, uh, that creates a ventricular septal defect, uh, and it also creates narrowing of the right ventricular outflow tract. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, because of that obstruction of the right ventricular outflow tract, uh, there is hypertrophy of the right ventricle. Mm -hmm. And so initially, that was the original blue baby uh, that I used to read about when I was a kid in the uh, encyclopedia. Uh, and that the, uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins in the 40s, they created the Blaylock Tausig uh, Thomas Shunt. And that was to increase the amount of blood flow uh, to the lungs, to treat, to palliate the, uh, the cyanosis. And then starting uh, in the 50s and the 60s, 
there was the intracardiac repair where, the, where the, an incision was made uh, over the right ventricular outflow tract, a VSD patch was sewn in, and the right ventricular outflow tract was reconstructed. Uh, and those were a lot of kids that were told that they were cured. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what we learned over time, uh, 20, 30, uh, sometimes 40 years, this very regurgitant pulmonary valve that we thought was very well tolerated comes back to cause trouble. So we're replacing, you know, uh, there are adults that show up with, um, with severe pulmonary regurgitation and need to have their pulmonary valve uh, replaced uh, and sometimes need to have their um, uh, tricuspid valve repaired mm -hmm. uh, and have ventricular arrhythmia ablation that goes with that, which is another interesting thing. We're also finding out that if, you have, if you're born with congenital heart disease, the likelihood that you'll develop atrial dysrhythmias over time is very high, mm -hmm. uh, maybe as high as 50 to 60 percent uh, over a period of 50 to 60 years. Mm -hmm. Another, the second most common uh, lesion that we talked about uh, was a transposition of the great arteries. Uh, again, that's another lesion that uh, makes you blue. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, if you look at the heart with the, uh, the systemic venous drainage, being uh, through the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava into the right atrium, drains into the right ventricle. And in the most common of the transpositions, detransposition of the great arteries, uh, the aorta uh, is, uh, comes, this is the picture to the right on the screen, the aorta arises from the right ventricle. And uh, on the left side, the pulmonary artery arises from the left ventricle. So you have two parallel circuits, the systemic venous return uh, going back to the systemic circulation, so blue blood being pumped around the body and returning and everything blue. And on the left side, blood being pumped from the uh, pulmonary veins into the left ventricle and back to the lungs. Mm -hmm. And left untreated, that's a, that's a, a non-survivable lesion uh, beyond uh, infancy and ch or childhood. Uh, and so there have been a number of different ways that has been treated since the, uh, since the 1950s. It's really amazing. Uh, in the late 1950s, uh, Dr. Senning created this operation, the Senning operation, which involves a number of different incisions and rotational flaps uh, using the tissue uh, of the right and left atria and the uh, uh, atrial septum to end up uh, inside the atrium baffling the flow that returns from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava to go to the left atrium mm -hmm. or uh, to go across the mitral valve uh, into the uh, left ventricle and then have that blood be pumped uh, to the pulmonary oh, artery. Right. Yeah. Right. And then vice versa, have the blood that comes from the pulmonary veins go around this uh, intraatrial tube and go to the right side across the tricuspid valve into the systemic right ventricle and then out the aorta. But that means that the RV then has to get thicker and strong, has, it has to become strong enough to tolerate the systemic uh, pressures. Wouldn't that be nice if that were the case? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's clearly the Achilles heel. Yeah, and so both with the setting operation and, and a more simplified mustard operation, which essentially does the same thing, but with a, with a patch, rather than these uh, rotational flaps, the mustard operation uses either pericardium or Gore-Tex or, or Dacron to do the same thing. And, and, but they both end up with the same problem, with, which is the right ventricle uh, doesn't, is a poor substitute 
for a systemic ventricle most of the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we think, uh, we talk about the right ventricle and the left ventricle, uh, and that uh, they, tr they are different uh, embryologically, they're different morphologically, and they're different functionally. And that uh, what we have found is that these atrial switch operations uh, work pretty well in uh, childhood and into young adulthood. But many of these patients over time uh, do develop uh, right ventricular failure uh, and tricuspid regurgitation. And it's striking in that, that oftentimes uh, uh, even just a mild impairment by ejection fraction of the right ventricle is a devastating impairment. You know, so an ejection fraction of 40% of the right ventricle is, is actually, would be the equivalent of somewhere being in like 18% mm -hmm. for the left ventricle. Mm -hmm. uh, having moderate uh, or moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation. It's kind of hard for me to, to be doing both of these things at the same time. No. no, you just have to continuously watch it, though, I think. It's back on. It's, we're back on? Oh, no, it's just frozen. Mm -hmm. Okay, no I, think it's, uh, no, I think it's working now. Okay, so you have to refresh it. Okay, I think we're good. All right, so. Okay, okay, go ahead. Well, I mean, it wasn't here. It's my computer. That's right. It's always my fault. It's the perfusionist's fault. Okay, go ahead, Derek. You know, some things are universal, Joe. So, yeah, I know. doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> I know. It's well, always your fault. Are, I know, I know, I know. I know, yeah. I, know I know, I know. It's a heavy burden you bear. I know, I know. There's no coffee. That's my fault, too. I know how it goes. Okay, so please. Yeah, and so, the, so, that, so it's very uncommon now to do these atrial switches, mm -hmm. but there are tens of thousands of patients around the world mm -hmm. who have had atrial switches that would, you know, that may show up on your doorstep, mm -hmm. uh, may, may go to, a, may go to a, a, a pediatric heart hospital, but, mm -hmm. but could develop uh, any number of problems that could end up uh, at, at any Cardiac well, let's say they end up. They, let's just say they end up with uh, 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 ACS, and they have a STEMI, mm -hmm. and they go to put a stent in, and they perf the LAD, mm -hmm. and now we're going to go to the uh, operating room. How? Uh, uh, what do we need to worry about? So, as perfusionists, with e any of these procedures, I mean, an ASD repair probably not, but let's say it's a tetralogy. Let's say it's the sending. Let's say it's a BT shunt, let's say it's, a, you know, an arterial switch. Um, what, what are some of the common, like when you look at a patient who's an adult, mm -hmm. not that you're doing an adult congenital, but a patient with previous repair, how do you talk to your perfusionist and say, these are the things I'm concerned about today? Very carefully and very respectfully, Joe. Yeah, very good, very good, that's excellent. <laughs> yeah. So, but, uh, well, so like with any, with any operation, and certainly with any re-operation, it's very important to understand exactly what the patient has had done. Uh, and, and, and I find it uh, uh, incredibly helpful, and, and I would say an imperative, to try to find the previous operative report. Uh, you know, if somebody has had, you know, whether they've had coronary bypass surgery or previous valve surgery, and certainly patients who have had congenital surgery uh, to get hold of that operative report. Uh, sometimes uh, the patient's mothers, if they're still alive, have a copy of it. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you can, if you can find out where somebody's had the operation, you can uh, get a hold of that uh, center to get the, the operative report. And imaging now is quite good, but, but you do want to understand what the anatomy is. Mm -hmm. Well, if, it's the, if Dr. Lumsden were here, imaging, 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 right? At it's least, all about at imaging. least, if not more than that, yeah, imaging, 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 imaging. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, but, but so, and, and that is one of the, that is a backstop that we have is that if you can't get a hold of the operative report, uh, there is really high resolution, high fidelity imaging that can help you sort it out. Uh, and and so the basic principles of perfusion, right? You want to drain the blue blood, 
pump in the red blood and, and, and hope there's not too big of a puddle on the floor, right? Uh, we try. Yeah. We try. Uh, and so, so certainly if you were going to uh, do a heart surgery on a patient that had, had, a, uh, uh, had uh, an atrial switch operation, uh, you'd, you'd really want to uh, bicavally cannulate that person uh, because uh, to, get, to get the systemic venous drainage, you wouldn't really be able to go directly into the right atrium. You'd have to go into the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and then I think the arterial cannulation would, would essentially be be the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you're doing a tricuspid valve, I realize you're doing a tricuspid valve from a surgical perspective, you're going to have to cut into it to get to it. How is that going to affect your approach? So the the tricuspid valve. So that would be the uh, you. So the the AV valves uh, are identified by the ventricle that they're attached to. So even though the, the, the right ventricle, uh, the morphologic right ventricle is where this, all the terminology gets confusing. So the morphologic right ventricle is the uh, systemic ventricle. That's pumping blood out so the So now aorta. that's the mitral. No, so the... So it's not really the mitral, but... It's, it's the tricuspid. It's, it's the tricuspid. So because it's the, because it's the morphologic right ventricle, uh, the the inflow valve is the tricuspid valve, uh, and so uh, just like on the left side, even though it's a morphologic left ventricle, and blood is going to the pulmonary circulation, it's it's the uh, mitral it's valve. Still the mitral. So still that the doesn't mitral change. Valve. That doesn't change. It goes the the name of the valve, and the morphology of the valve goes along with the ventricle. Okay. 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 Yeah. I didn't know that. So, uh, well, now you do. Now that's something I hope yeah. everybody will learn today. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but, so, so, but, but I would say the, you know, if, you're, if your surgeon is going to try to repair a tricuspid valve that's regurgitant in somebody who's had an atrial switch operation, you, you may want to, before the surgery, tap them on the shoulder and say, are you sure? <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's uh, these ventricles, these uh, systemic right ventricles, uh, will not behave very well. Uh, they will very commonly end up on ECMO uh, and uh, without a very good, if you don't have an exit strategy, you may be unhappy. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, you know it's, we think about certainly in adult heart surgery that adding a tricuspid ring is no big deal if you're doing a mitral operation or uh, if you're doing an aortic valve or coronary, but it, it is a big deal. That would be the that would be the double black diamond sign to uh, to get out there is that that these patients who are had atrial switches beware of the systemic right ventricle, beware of the moderate uh, or severely regurgitant tricuspid valve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you have any um, do you have any by any chance any pictures of you know probably the the, the like the most common congenital anomalies that uh, that we would see in the adult uh, congenital population. In other words, patients who made it to adulthood that uh, did not need, uh, that, that, that never got their, their problem corrected. Well, so I guess probably the most common things that we see would be atrial septal defects, mm -hmm. of which there are different kinds. Oh, yeah, thanks. Jeez, Joe, you think I'd remember that by now. It's okay. You're a heart surgeon. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a specialist. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the most common atrial septal defects that we see are secundum atrial septal defects. They make up about 80% of the uh, uh, atrial septal defects. And that's, that is right in the middle of the atrial septum. Now, this doesn't include patent foramen ovales, which are even more common. Okay. Uh, but they, patent foramen ovale and a secundum atrial septal defect are in the same place. In fact, uh, the way I like to think about them is um, the, that location, that uh, fossa ovalis, uh, is a doorway that when you're a, a fetus, that door is open and blood goes from the right side to the left side, it's oxygenated blood that 
comes from your mom's placenta, from your placenta, from your mom. And then when you're born, that door slams shut and locks. So if the door doesn't lock and it's able to open and close, that's a patent for Amen O'Valley. If there's something missing from that door, if there's a piece of the door missing, there's a hole, or if it's like a, an old-fashioned Dutch door where uh, the top part is missing, that's a secundum atrial septal defect. Ah, okay. Okay, so they're in the same place, but they're, they're structurally different. The second most common uh, is a sinus venosus atrial septal defect. And they're most commonly up at the junction of the supravena cava and the right atrium. And they're commonly associated with uh, anomalous pulmonary venous return, meaning uh, some of the pulmonary veins, most commonly on the right, right upper lobe, uh, right middle lobe, drain into the supravena cava. Uh, and uh, you sometimes can get sinus venosus defects that are low uh, that uh, down by the inferior vena cava, uh, and they are, uh, can be associated with an anomalous uh, venous drainage uh, scimitar syndrome, which is an unusual, but uh, uh, sometimes patients uh, that are adults show up with that. Uh, uh, and and you, it's very easy to the uninitiated to falsely make the diagnosis of a secundum atrial septal defect. Uh, when in fact it's a, an inferior sinus venosus defect. Uh, and then there's these primum defects. People sometimes refer to them as primum ASDs. Uh, to, uh, to be the, uh, I don't know whether I'm erudite or uh, uh, arrogant, but it's, they're not really uh, an atrial septal defect. They're more of an endocardial cushion defect. They're, same, they're in the category of uh, AV canals. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're down at the, at the crooks of where the two atria and the two ventricles meet at that common... Um, kind of like the four corners. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. It would be, in, if, in a common AV canal, that'd be the no corners. Mm -hmm. Right. Because there's a, yeah. So, but, uh, but they, you'll commonly see that. That's a, uh, referred to as a primum, some people say primum ASD, and they're almost always associated with a cleft mitral valve. Mm -hmm. uh, so th those are, those would be pretty common things that you'd see in adults. Uh, most of the time now, uh, secundum atrial septal defects and PFOs, it's rare for them to be closed surgically now because they're so well uh, managed in the cath lab mm -hmm. by interventional uh, congenital cardiologists. Sinus venosus defects and primum defects uh, we not uncommonly see in adults. Mm -hmm. So let's do this while you continue to show us some more, some more images and some things that we may see in the adult world. Can we go ahead and open the phone lines in case anybody does want to call? And I'll remind everyone that, uh, that uh, you, they can text here. Uh, we'll look at some more more pictures. Now let's go ahead and leave it tight on uh, on Dr. McGillery and keep his images up. This is a, this is a car some cartoons I have up there now for patients who have a sinus venosus defect uh, and how you would there are several different ways to fix that. Cannulation is a little bit different. Again, you'd want to bicavally cannulate. And, and, and the way I, I choose to do it is I, rather than cannulating the supravena cava, I usually will cannulate the innominate vein mm. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for, to get uh, upper drainage. And you cannulate the uh, low in the right atrium or the inferior vena cava for, uh, for that. And you can do uh, uh, either use a, a cup, you know, patch and use a patch of, I use autologous pericardium, some people use Gore-Tex, or to, to baffle the flow across these anomalous veins to the left atrium. Mm -hmm. Or a, a very elegant operation is the Warden operation, where you divide the supravena cava uh, and then patch close where the uh, supravena cava normally goes into the right atrium with the patch 
being on the right atrial side of that defect. And now that allows the pulmonary veins to drain through the remnant of the superior vena cava as a, as a pathway into the left atrium. And then the superior vena cava is then uh, anastomosed onto the right atrial appendage. Uh, kind of a cool, uh, interesting operation. So if you had a patient that came in with a sinus spinosis defect with mm -hmm. anomalous pulmonary venous turn, as, and they were 26 years old, I don't know how common it would be to see a 26-year-old with that defect like that well, that I mean, made it that long. Yeah. Um, but this is what you would do. This is, this is what you do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now what about, uh, I know you want to talk about this, but uh, well, I'll bring it up. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up at the next question. Let's I want go to ahead. talk about whatever you want to talk about. Jim. Well, we'll do. We'll do I, I'll, I'll save the question. I'll remember it. <laughs> yeah. Another, uh, another uncommon, uh, but uh, leading to see would be a patient with an Epstein's anomaly. They they can present really any time. Um, where are we here? Uh, any time in uh, life. Uh, kids that uh, present in heart failure. Uh, uh, as an infant with Epstein's anomaly, and I've operated on people in their 60s who show up short of breath uh, and get a chest x-ray and see significant cardiomegaly. Uh, and Epstein's anomaly is a, uh, is a, uh, is a, uh, is a, a malformation of the tricuspid valve as it, uh, when it forms and the septal leaflet uh, becomes right ventricularized. Uh, and then uh, the uh, part of the right ventricle uh, between where the normal annulus is supposed to be uh, becomes uh, very, very thin or atrialized. Uh, we used to uh, replace those uh, tricuspid valves. And again, it seemed like a pretty straightforward thing to do. Uh, but now uh, many of us are doing a more uh, complex reconstruction, the cone operation, where we essentially disconnect the uh, attachments, um, uh, the, what would be the annular attachments of the tricuspid valve uh, and uh, reattach them back to where they're supposed to be and create a cone, like an ice cream cone. Uh, and uh, sew the, uh, uh, the valve back together and, and, to, and then decrease the size of the annulus to a more normal size. Mm -hmm. And this works very, very well, particularly in children, but also in adults. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, involved uh, and very elegant operation that seems to work very well uh, and so far has very good durability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, I guess the other thing I can talk about is sort of these uh, the, you know, fontans. What, what, what else would you like me no, to No, that's, that's a good one. Fontans are fontans, good. Fontans. You like fontans? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so, oh, there, I, I got to get back to where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, so, so we use the term Fontan to uh, describe many different things. I mean, isn't that the way it is in heart surgery? Uh, in medicine, too, we use the same words to describe different things and different words to describe the same things. But the, the Fontan operation is essentially uh, uh, a, a concept rather than a procedure uh, in that, uh, that uh, babies born with complex heart disease that you're not able to uh, have uh, a uh, two ventricles, one pumping to the lungs and one pumping to the systemic circulation, uh, a Fontan operation or more uh, appropriately uh, called now would be a total cable pulmonary connection. Uh, and what that means is whatever ventricle you have, whether it's a right or a left ventricle, you would transition that to be the systemic ventricle uh, and, uh, and take the systemic venous return and surgically redirect the uh, systemic blood flow, the systemic venous return, directly to the pulmonary arteries so that it is not, it does not go through a ventricle. So it would have to be passively draining. 
passively drained. So this cartoon is of a uh, total cable pulmonary connection using an extra cardiac conduit. And that's a mouthful. Uh, but let me just sort of walk you through this a little bit. We, we tend to do this in stages. So when, when an infant is born, uh, we would do probably, this is a modified blalock tausig shunt. Uh, the real, the classic blalock tausig shunt would be to take and disconnect the subclavian artery and sew it directly onto the pulmonary artery, a branch pulmonary artery. A modified blalock tausig shunt is you take a prosthesis dacron or Gore-Tex uh, and sew that onto either the innominate artery or a subclavian artery and sew it to a branch pulmonary artery. And that is of fixed resistance. And as the baby grows into a child, they'll eventually outgrow that. And then the next step would be to do a bi-directional glen shunt, uh, which is we would uh, take down the modified Boilek-Tausig shunt and replace that with a end to side anastomosis of the super vena cava to the pulmonary artery. So that, certainly in a child, would take half of the systemic venous return and have it go directly to the pulmonary arteries. And then we would come back at a later stage to complete what many of us would say the Fontan. Uh, the classic one was to sew the right atrial appendage to the main pulmonary artery. You, you would divide the main pulmonary artery, over sew that, and so the atrial appendage to the main pulmonary artery. That evolved to a lateral tunnel where you would sew the, uh, the, the, the upper part of the supravena cava towards the head had already been sewn onto the uh, right pulmonary artery. And at the completion phase, you'd sew the inferior portion of the supravena cava uh, to the underside of that pulmonary artery and take a piece of Gore-Tex usually, and sew that inside the atrium to create this lateral tunnel. Uh, and then uh, have that go, have now the supravena cava by way of the glen shunt and the inferior vena cava by way of this lateral tunnel go to the pulmonary arteries. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and now a more common way to do it is a, with an extra cardiac conduit. Uh, that avoids some of the arrhythmia problems, avoids the atrium dilating, even with a lateral tunnel, can dilate and uh, cause flow and rhythm problems. This extra cardiac conduit, just take a Gore-Tex tube or a Dacron tube or a homograph, and sew that to the inferior vena cava and correct, uh, connect it to the, to the uh, pulmonary artery. So you can imagine now when you're talking about cannulation strategies, it becomes a little more complicated. It appears so. Yeah, and this, this is something that probably, uh, if, if somebody with a, with a Fontan showed up on your doorstep, um, probably would be, no, it absolutely would be better sent by ambulance or helicopter to, to a congenital center. And if you can't, if you couldn't, then you have got to get somebody um, on the phone or yeah. through some other means to uh, to be able to help you through that if you didn't have that option. No question. So yeah. I, I am curious. I saw that your next slide, you kind of jumped through it, but your your next slide had to do with the 40-year follow-up yeah. on Fontana. So what is the life expectancy of uh, somebody with, with all of this? Yeah. Not only what is their life expectancy, but what is their... Um, what is their, their quality of life for that life expectancy? It's a great question, Joe. And, and so, uh, like all great questions, the answers aren't as great. The, uh, uh, it depends. A lot of it depends upon what the underlying lesion was. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that for kids that have a, a left ventricle who've had either a extra cardiac conduit or a lateral tunnel, uh, they, they actually do pretty well. They, they can function really, uh, 
you wouldn't know they had it. They can. Uh, we we used to be very very careful with not letting them play sports or uh, for young women not ha letting them have children, and and if they have a good systemic ventricle uh, and a good repair, they they can play sports and they can have children. Uh, if they have a right uh, side, if they have a morphologic right ventricle. Uh, and if they've had more of a classic Fontan, uh, they, they, their quality of life, uh, their functional quality of life is not as good. Uh, and if you look, here's a graph that I have. Uh, do I have it here? Yeah, yeah. it'll come up. Yeah, that, uh, that depends if you're an optimist or a pessimist. Uh, the optimist, if you think that most of these uh, people who have had this operation were not expected to make it to be, you know, into the double digits, that's a pretty good, mm -hmm. uh, that's a pretty good curve. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, uh, you know, we, like everything in uh, life and certainly in medicine, the more success we have, the more success we want. Right. Uh, and so we're constantly trying to figure out uh, you know, a, a, an operation that we do now is a Fontan conversion for uh, uh, older adults or, oh, excuse me, older children or teenagers or adults who have had uh, a classic Fontan uh, or a lateral tunnel that now have rhythm problems or stasis problems. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was going to ask you, you about can, anticoagulation on these yeah. patients. I mean, is that... I mean, because it's really hard to play sports and have children if you're on, uh, of course, you know, either Coumadin or yep. Zarelto. Right. Yeah. So it depends. I'm, I'm, that's my answer. I'm sticking to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, each one of these uh, people, each one of these patients needs to be individualized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. So being that I don't know the answer to this, um, and I'm curious. So sure, you know the answer to almost everything. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, let's let's all don't, let's, don't, George, you, you, you let's kind save, of rock in my world right now. Let's save time. Let's save time and just assume I'm never wrong. Um, however, uh, there's heart transplant. I mean, obviously, we have a problem with uh, enough donors, yeah. and then if that's your first line of resolving these patients, these kids with these very complex uh, lesions that are going to be comp difficult to, to deal with, um, the heart, um, you know, does not actually, doesn't grow with the, with the patient. Is that correct? They will outgrow it or will they grow with the patient? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, the uh, question is, does something grow or does it dilate? Uh, uh, you know, that's uh, whether it sort of you get uh, uh, hyperplasia or hypertrophy. But so we, we used to be very leery about transplantation in congenital patients. Uh, oftentimes, they've had multiple operations. Uh, oftentimes, they're highly sensitized because of the multiple operations uh, that they've had. The natural history of how these patients with heart failure and congenital heart disease, they behave differently. Uh, they can be functionally much better than somebody who has ischemic cardiomyopathy or, or, or a non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. So historically, they haven't really been, the status that they've had uh, on waiting lists have they, they kind of put them at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. But what we have learned is that although the initial morbidity and mortality rate is a little bit higher for transplantation with congenital heart disease, the long-term survival is actually better than any of the diagnoses. If you look on, this is a recent UNOS uh, mm -hmm. survival curve. Uh, usually when you show Kaplan-Meier curves, people, their eyes kind of roll back and they start to uh, sort of nod off and go to sleep. But this, this yellow line is the natural history of or survival of patients with transplantations with congenital heart disease, and uh, that the long-term survival is actually pretty good mm -hmm. compared with the long-term survival of some of the other diagnoses. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, it looks like it's, you know, uh, let's see, the, let's just take the 50% mark out about 11 years. Oh, uh, 12 oh, years. you've got to get your new pair of glasses. It's yeah. like 15 years. Where, 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 show me the, show me the line. Right here. Not Fifty percent survival at fifty years. 15 okay, years. at fifteen years. Okay, yeah. so yeah, well, it's pretty light on my screen. I don't have the, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, if you had a better quality slide, I could see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, another that's, color besides yeah. yellow. Well, see, for, you know, I was yellow colorblind. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, so fifteen, so fifty percent at fifteen years. So on, on a heart transplant of a, of a. Uh, a uh, forty-year-old with a uh, idiopathic cardiomyopathy. What's that going to be? Let's compare so, it to that. Yeah. So let's. Uh, funny you should say that, Joe. So that's the blue line. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the fifth, the fifty percent survival is twelve years. Wow. See, I knew you'd say that. Wow. <laughs> you so can it see really is pretty good. Yeah, it's better now. So uh, and and so, but and, and so I a couple of months ago, my partners and I. We did a third heart transplant on a woman in her, that's 40, who had had two previous heart transplants, wow. one when she was a child, then one when she was in her early 20s. So, so and she, she, she did great. Wow. Oh, that's yeah, they impressive. Used to, that's, it, that's the same word, yeah. <laughs> Very wow. good. Wow. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, it's four minutes to seven o'clock. Any questions? I know you. We have a lot of questions. We mean, yes, but you, you will miss your appointment, and we don't want well, to do I'm that. I'm happy to answer okay. some questions. Okay, very good. So, uh, well, I'll answer the question then. Uh, Kurt, you got any questions? I don't know at the moment. Anybody on the web have any questions? Anybody in the audience have any questions? No? Okay. So, uh, with that said, since our next topic is going to actually be ECMO. Yeah. So... ECMO in the congenital world. You, you, I'm assuming, have done quite a bit of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's always been very good, you know, really pretty decent outcomes with ECMO in kids. But yet there's still today a lot of people who feel ECMO in the adult population is pointless. What's your view on that? So, I mean, ECMO, certainly for children, and I would say... Uh, adults with congenital heart disease, that ECMO has been the the workhorse for uh, mechanical uh, cardiopulmonary support, uh, and uh, in part, it's due to the great successes that successes that we have had in children. In part, it's due to the lack of other mechanical circulatory support devices uh, that. That don't. I mean, they don't work as well for congenital heart diagnoses as they do for uh, non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathies. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a big problem with congenital heart disease is biventricular failure or right ventricular failure. And <clears throat> most of the commercially available ventricular assist devices are designed to support a normal, uh, a normal morphologic, although abnormally functioning uh, left ventricle. Mm -hmm. uh, so ECMO has been, uh, has served our patients uh, very, very well. Uh, you know, there's, there has been, uh, as many people term it, an ECMO explosion in the last 10 years or so, uh, not only in our, in, in the United States, but also around the world. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that with that, uh, the outcomes have not been as good as people would like, in part probably because of the selection. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think that we should be very careful not to cast aspersions on a technology because it's not necessarily being used mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. in the right patients and mm -hmm. the right time for the right reason. Mm -hmm. that's, a common, that's a common thread with a lot of different uh, therapeutic modalities that exist. That it is, you know, when it is not used as it's intended yeah. uh, or used too late, then you uh, tend to really have a problem. Now, what about the um, the total artificial heart yeah. and the future of congenital uh, 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 surgery or, or congenital anomalies and how we treat them? Whether we do surgery like this or we are going to be implanting devices in these kids. 
Yeah, that's a great question, Joe. I, I think that uh, certainly in my professional lifetime, uh, left ventricular assist devices have really uh, evolved to being dependable, durable uh, support devices. And I think that we are uh, putting smaller, we're making smaller devices that we can put in patients who are less sick and get better outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, the total artificial heart has been uh, under evolution. It is not a, it has not, at least to this point in time, evolved uh, as rapidly and as effectively as um, LVADs have. But I, I, I do think that the syncardia uh, has been a giant step forward. Uh, and uh, certainly in patients with biventricular dysfunction who are big O's or highly sensitized, uh, it is a very good treatment as a bridge to transplant. Uh, I, I, I know that... So not uh, as destination, but as a bridge to, so as a bridge it's, to it's, transplant. It's, it's, it's approved for as a bridge to transplant. Okay. Right and you know, the total artificial heart, uh, uh, you know, our friends uh, Billy Cohn and Bud Frazier yeah. uh, are very close to uh, implanting their total artificial heart that I think will revolutionize its use. Uh, in all kinds of patients, and mm -hmm. including congenital heart disease patients. Mm -hmm. This is the one that he's doing, in, uh, is it with, and is it in collaboration with J&J, &J, I think? I think it's, I think it's, uh, so, so Billy it? is, uh, Billy is uh, uh, a very um, important person at J&J, &J, but I think it's separate from J&J. Separate from J&J, &J. Yeah. okay, very good. And then uh, let's talk, you know, very briefly about xenotransplants. So I, I laugh because, I mean, it's a, a, the biology, of, I mean, ideally, that would be great uh, to have a xenotransplant. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's taking uh, uh, an organ from another animal uh, and using that heart or liver or kidney uh, to be implanted into a human. Uh, it's been done in humans. Uh, uh, Dr. Bailey, baby Faye. Baby Faye, yeah, and even uh, Dr. Hardy, even before that, uh, in the in the '60s, uh, and uh, the immunologic barriers are uh, very, very uh, tall and wide and long and deep. Mm -hmm. uh, but but there have been a lot of progress made uh, in in the lab. Uh, I, I laughed earlier on because uh, certainly Dr. Shumway, who was uh, world famous heart transplant surgeon at Stanford used to say that, uh, uh, you know, xenotransplantation is right around the corner and always will be. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it, it is something that people have been very actively working on, uh, but have not really, it, it's still far from, from being, uh, being used mm -hmm. uh, in, in people, at least at this point in time. Okay. I, let me give you an easier one, though. What about... That was easy. <laughs> 3D printing and, well, I want to be easier. 3D printing and, uh, and cloning of, uh, of organs. Yeah. So, yeah, 3D printing is, I mean, something that's being done right this minute. Uh, I mean, it is really, uh, has been an incredible. 3D print guns. I don't think we're allowed to talk about that. Okay. Oh, this is Texas. We can talk about <laughs> that. We can talk about yeah. that here. So, uh, right. Uh, but but uh, Carly, you know, in, in, in certainly, with the imaging that you had um, in the old days, you'd kind of squint and think you saw what you were going to see at surgery. But in fact, you know, when you got in there, you had to sort of sort it out. Uh, in my professional lifetime, imaging has really dramatically advanced. And what you see on the image is what you see at surgery. Um, with 3D printing, you can get a high fidelity model of complex congenital heart disease. And so you can essentially do a dress rehearsal of your operation, uh, certainly go through all of the cognitive steps and the technical steps in your office on this uh, model before you go to the patient. And that has um, been a tremendous advancement in congenital heart disease. It's being used uh, for, uh, 
you know, as you, you talked about cloning organs, uh, I've, got a, uh, I've got a friend of mine in Boston, Harold Ott, who is, is uh, biologically engineering organs. Uh, uh, and so if you could take a 3D printed model and uh, use that as a scaffold to then uh, implant with stem cells or uh, any other kind of pluripotent um, cell, uh, that that may be another avenue that we will follow in parallel with xenotransplantation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that means the stem cells, of course, is is huge, and uh, you know that's I think gr continuing to grow as well. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, take, uh, I don't know if you, there was somebody here in Houston, I don't remember who it was, uh, that was taking hearts. Uh, removing the genetic material from them, mm -hmm. then implanting the patient's uh, genetic material into it and letting that, you know, uh, culture. Um, but I don't know whatever happened with that program. Yeah, that was that, so that's Doris Taylor. That's uh, it. And, uh, and, and Harold Ott, who I mentioned, was one of uh, uh, Dr. Taylor's postdoc fellows who's now. Uh, on his own and working in parallel with Dr. Taylor, and it, it's there's been a lot of exciting advances in that, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, everything from I think that the Holy Grail was to be able to uh, use detergent to decellularize the heart and then repopulate it with uh, a patient's cells, uh, but but uh, and and I know Harold has done it with animal kidneys and lungs and livers. Uh, and he's now working on that same principle to make valves and, uh, and patches of uh, patient's own tissues. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, uh, Kurt, any, any questions? No questions. No questions? Very, okay. very interesting. Well, Dr. McGilvery, I want to thank you very much. For yeah, my